Hey everybody out there on Drum Talk TV Facebook land, we're here at Desert Ridge Music Academy in the North Phoenix area with Glenn Sobel. Well, Glenn, I gotta tell you something about Glenn. Glenn has been interviewed on Drum Talk TV more than any other artist. And yeah, between the Bonzo Bashes and the right. Ham Show and doing stuff like Who that. Who knew? But he was also the very first pro drummer that I interviewed on Drum Talk TV. Did you know that? That I did know. Yeah. Yeah, I was in my kitchen doing that interview. And, I, and yeah. we were... Example of Bonzo's triplets. You do a lot of linear playing in your drum solos with Alice. And I'm the interesting thing is I think if you take someone who does not play drums and you put sticks in their hands and you say, hey, keep a beat, you know, it's impossible for them to hit the bass drum and the hi-hat at the same time and all the things that now I realize they take for granted as a drummer because that comes so natural that I cannot play without hitting more than one right. thing at a time. Or you cannot play your right hand without your right foot and they're like stuck together. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it, common. You gotta unglue those. Yeah, exactly the process. Um, I, as a drummer, I'm doing my best to unwind my brain. There's a new drummer, well, he's new to me, who's playing I'm Falling in Love With with the band Haken, um, Raymond Hearn, and Glenn and I were talking about that briefly. And his drumming is not all linear, but it's, it's so much non-linear that when he does a linear fill, it's like, whoa, it just throws everything <laughs> off. It's really cool. Who was your biggest influence for that style of playing? Linear? I mean, it starts with David Garibaldi, mm -hmm. who's like the, the grandfather of linear funk playing. And Tower of Power. Tower of Power. In the early, mid-70s, mm -hmm. they came out, and that blew people's minds. Which is a great thing to happen, actually, to, to fall into something that turns out to be a great idea. And then you start thinking about how much further you can take it, and you get no sleep at night. Right. It's great. And <laughs> you touched on different drum kits. There were some great questions today during the clinic, and you talked about the clinic kit, the different session kit, the residency kit, the Alice kit, all these different size kits. And when it comes to voicing, you can get really creative with voicing even on a four-piece kit. Yeah. But a lot of players, like Bozio, like Neil Peart, a lot of my early influences, Phil Collins, um, Carl Palmer, um, all these players that have really big kits, there's this myth, I don't know how this started, but a lot of drummers criticize other drummers with big kits that think, oh, they don't know how to play a four-piece. And that's, that's like saying an off-road truck racer doesn't know how to drive on the freeway. It just makes no sense at all so and they're not compensating for anything either do you own one of those right we hear that about four wheel no one knows right well some of us know a little bit but it's it's all about it's like an
<laughs> that was something with Alice early on. The producer, Bob Ezrin, he said uh, he wanted to get another higher tom sound, so I added the 10 to the kit, which is off to the left. left. It's like the flying 10, we call it. It's over here, and then there's the high, and then was 12, 13, 16, 18. But he said there's certain places where there needs to be more dramatic drum fills, you know. More tonal range, the right? Tonal range, yeah. yeah, that's another way to put it. But sometimes it's just, it needs to be that meat and potatoes, kick snare hat. You just got to know where and when. Yeah. Just because it's there, it doesn't mean you have to hit it. Right. In every song. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another great question that came in, and the topic you brought up was the real world application of rudiments. My, and, and hand techniques. Yeah. yeah. And, and my favorite personal example, I'm curious what yours is, if it's the same, because I know this guy's an influence of both of us. My favorite example of that is the paradiddles and creating a beat that just is a paradiddal in You Fool No One by Deep Purple with Ian Pace on the drums. And that whole beat is it's a paradiddal with the foot matching the right hand on the cowbell and the left hand doing the other half of it. That's my favorite example. Of yeah, that's a perfect example of rudiments actually used in a song. And we could go on and on and on about that. And it's, it's a great thing. A lot of students, they ask, why do I got to learn rudiments? It's like a kid having to eat their vegetables. Why do I got to right. eat broccoli? You know? And they don't know they're doing rudiments when they do a roll around the kit. It's a single it's stroke, a single stroke <laughs> roll. That, that's the, the first two rudiments usually a student would learn would be singles and doubles. Mm -hmm. And there's an old jazz guy saying, you've heard this I'm sure, they say there's only two rudiments, a single stroke and a double stroke, because every other rudiment is a combination it's of those. Yeah. yeah, and there's exceptions. Flam taps are, that has triple strokes in it, and a flam at diddle has right. four in a row. But for all intenses and you know and for all purposes singles and doubles you got to have those together before you go into the six stroke rolls and the paradiddles it'll make all of that come together a lot easier and a good teacher will explain that and show why it's important to do this not just do it because i said so but do it because you're going to become a better player and you're going to get very creative with all these these new tools right um one question that was asked as part of another question to you regarding the different kits and setups the, the one thing that you might have forgotten that was asked as part of that question, I want to ask again. Is recent to really make it in the business. Who do you admire that may not be an influence, but you admire their playing that's kind of newer on the scene that you would recommend we all check out as drummers? There's kinda. a lot of people out there making things happen, a lot of new players. Man, you just flip through Instagram and you could see all kinds of players. Uh, there's definitely some, some guys on YouTube that I've been checking out a lot, and I, I can't think of one. If you're talking in the last five or so years, give me a name. It's probably something uh, uh, I've. For me, again, um, the guy from, uh, from Haken, 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 yeah, yeah right? Raymond Hearn, he's got, they got five I've yet to check that out, but I've been hearing a lot uh, about it, so. It's really a great album, it is, um, in every way, the drumming, the production, the compositions, and I explained to Glenn, it sounds like Rush grown up, it's like. Rush so, never grew up? Right, well, I mean, their music, it, it's, it's like taking that as a base. Uh -huh. And then really getting even more substance into it. No right. offense to Russia's music. I grew up playing it and everything. But it's just a whole other level of those styles of the deep cuts and deep compositions. And they're, they, they're a rock band that's an orchestra, basically. Nice. Yeah, really great stuff. Nice. Yeah, there's, there are so many players out there. It's what is sometimes a problem is there's too much out there, at least... Back before streaming and before MP3 we had files. access to it, we have, yeah. yeah, you got to concentrate on one record because you had to go to the store and pay for a CD or a cassette or a record, and you concentrated on that one thing. You soaked right. it all in, then you got enough money to buy another right. and another. And, and when we had records and we found a fill like in um, 
natural science, let's say, if I rush. <laughs> I remember lifting the needle, playing it, lifting the needle, playing it. And it's one measure. So you're like waiting for it to finish. Lift the needle, lift the needle, lift the needle. Till I got it in my head and your brain knows to slow what it down to, do. to 16 RPM. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and even if your brain knows what to do, then you got to teach your limbs to do it all. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was good. You know, we had to listen. Yeah. We didn't, there wasn't a lot of tools today. There's a lot of amazing tools where you can feed a song into a program and it slows it down to half speed, but keeps the pitch. You know, that's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. And back, you know, before all this stuff that's come around in just the last few years, you really had to use your own ears mm -hmm. and try to pick it out. And maybe it wasn't the exact thing that was on the record, but you kept, you got something good out of it. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. You know, it influenced you to do something different. Yeah. You touched on, Glenn also touched on one of my favorite topics when it comes to drumming. And that is understanding the difference between the math of the song, where the notes go, and getting the feel. So when we're talking about emulating influences, my favorite example is When the Levy Breaks by John Bonham. The math is simple, it's just But to make it feel the way it sounds, it's got it's gotta breathe, you gotta have the hi-hat just loose yeah. enough, but not too swish. I played that song at Bonzo Bash last yeah. year. Yeah, I was looking forward to playing that on that full-on Bonham style kit, 26 by 14, no hole in the front. I mean, the bottomisms come out. You play yeah. that kind of kit. Hopefully, you'll start to play more like that and, or at least get it, why he sounded the way he sounded. There's actually a video I put up. I, I mentioned a drum festival I did in Spain last year. Yeah. And I had flown directly from Brazil. And it took a couple days to get there, whatever. And I said, well, I, I, should, I need to practice before the festival, maybe the morning of or the night before. You got a kit that you can set up for me in some room, any random kit. They said, yeah. I showed up. They said, yeah, the kit is down in the wine cellar. It was this big cavernous wine cellar. That's the kind of clinic You see that video? Play. Well, this was just for a warm-up <laughs> room. That. Yeah, and, and what do you think was the beat I played and put, made a video oh, of? in a cavernous room like Because when the Living yeah. Breaks was recorded in a giant atrium sort of foyer to the mansion they were in with one microphone and it was like setting your drum kit up in a big shower right? i'm telling you find that video the drum sound is just like it it was cool. it was perfect i mean people knew what i was going to play before i even said they're like oh i know you probably played levy right yeah i did of course what else would you play yeah yeah but yeah that's that's a great example of, of feel versus just the notes on a page you gotta you gotta listen to the music there are players that are all songs, they just want to learn songs. And there are players that are all technique, they just want to work on technique. You got to have both. Yeah, and, and that feel is everything. How you hit it, where you hit it. Like Glenn was showing, the difference between the center of the snare versus just north of it. You get more resonance out of the drum. Uh, the, the rim shot, same thing, all the different positions of the cymbal and the different parts of the stick you hit it with are all going to change the voicings. Does anyone have any questions? And online, I'll check, I'll follow along. Do you have any questions for Glenn Sobel about drumming, gardening, cooking, <laughs> wardrobe, anything? I would stick to drumming. Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Did you ever listen to any Buddy Rich? Oh, of course. How can you be a drummer and not be influenced by Buddy? I, I, first time I was ever exposed him was on television. It was Frank Sinatra concert for the Americas. And there was Buddy doing the drum so where, where he was apparently under the weather. He was sick, but that's like a, a famous YouTube clip now, but back then I caught it on television, I think when that first came out. And of course, there was all the, the records with the big band that he'd done for years, and then eventually there was the, the scholarship memorial concerts where they had a lot of uh, hidden, unseen video of him from back in the day. They released a lot of that. And yeah, way ahead of his time. And uh, just a great drum solo, all the dynamics used, and a great band leader. Yeah. Sure. My first was it. Uh, book was a Buddy Rich book from 1970. The Rudiments book. Yes. Modern Interpretation of Snare Drum Rudiments. And I still yeah. have it. That's I got an important it in book. It breaks down the rudiments. Yeah. That's what I started with, too. Yeah. The red cover, black mm -hmm. and white picture of them. Yeah. I have it. That and the Ted Reed syncopation. Book. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. And anyone else have questions? I'm going to check online while we're doing it here. Anybody? No more questions? Yeah. Did and a lot of questions during the clinic. In the back? Yeah. Well, it's doing okay. You know, I, I did have one earplug, and I had the, just to hear the click on the songs, 
But live on tour, we're all on the in-ear monitors. They're molds. Yeah. You know, someone like comes to you, they do a house call from one of these, you know, these institutes that do the in-ear monitors. They have this thing that looks like a turkey baster and they inject clay into your ear. And it, it sits there for like five, ten minutes and they pull it out and they got a perfect mold of your inner ear and then they make you your in-ear monitors and you, you fit them in and it's a little tight at first but your ears get used to it. And it's like it's all enclosed. You're on stage and there are some musicians, mostly old school, they hate them. It, it makes them feel like they're in a different I room. A great I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. I like it. And our bass player with Hollywood Vampires, Chris Wise, he's been doing no inners forever. He plays with you know the Colt Ace Freely, no inners for years. He got him on the Hollywood Vampires tour, and he's like, oh yeah, this is gonna take time to get used to. After one gig, he's like, why haven't I done this for the last 20 years? He loved it. <laughs> And he, he didn't have to dig in his heart. He was able to play the same, but it just makes you able to relax better. you got to have a good Man. monitor guy. Yeah, gotta have a cool yeah you got to have a, a team of people working on that. But we are lucky enough to have some great sound people working with us. And I get the click track fed to me when I need it. Nothing's too loud. There's never any feedback. That's not something that happens. And so you don't go deaf also. You, you, the mass survive, you can control that. So I'm really not playing without hearing protection that doesn't, that doesn't happen that much. On tour, there is hearing protection in the form of ear monitors. Yeah. I can't imagine having the stuff injected. Mine were made... It's weird, yeah. Yeah, mine were laser scanned. Oh, yeah, laser. that's newer, okay. Yeah. I haven't yeah. had my dinner in a while. I guess that would be how it's done now. Yeah. Laser yeah. technology. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, there's an online question from a drummer you know. Oh, yeah? Who I just spent some time with in Singapore at the Singapore Drum Fest. Brandon Koo. Hey, hey what's Brandon? up? Brandon. Brandon know says... That guy? Uh, can you talk more about your linear application? Well, real world examples other than solos. Oh, sure. I mean, it's it's a beat before it's a lick to me. There's a ton of beats that are considered like linear beats, like like that Steve Gadd group Lenore by Chick Corea. That's a perfect example. It's sort of a pseudo Latin feel, which a lot of those might end up sounding like. That's a great song to check out. Uh, Man, there's, there's a great song that Tom Breckline played on. I, I really believe he's an underrated guy. Uh, there's a saxophonist named Brandon Fields. He always had killer drummers on his records. Greg Bissonette was on one from the mid-80s, and then he put out another that had like Vinny and Breckline. And Tom is on this song called You Got It. And I'll bet you could find that online easily. Brandon Fields, Tom Breckline on drums. The song is You Got It. A great linear groove, which was very influential to me. And, and the list goes on and on. There's a ton. Even Neil Peart played a lot of yeah. linear stuff back in the day. Yeah. And, and that's what it is first to me. It's something musical before it's a lick or a solo. Right. Cool. A couple more questions, and then we'll let Glenn just hang with you folks. Our live in-studio audience, which you should be at here at Desert Ridge Music Academy in Phoenix. Of course, well, people are Brandon's watching from in Singapore. 130 yeah. countries. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Casey Grill is watching. The last person I hey. interviewed right here. Hey, Casey. Nice. From uh, Queensryche. Anyone here at Queensryche? Yeah? Casey's watching. That's right. Hey, Casey. Hey, Casey. Hey, Casey. That's right. There you go. Congrats, dude. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. That's a cool gig, right? Uh, Cam Barnes says my... F oh, I thought he said feet keep freezing. He means the feed. <laughs> um, let me find one more. Yeah, that's a head stick rap. Um, that just started from playing outdoor summer concerts where it just gets really hot and you're sweating and the stick just gets slippery and then you have to grip it harder. And I don't have a great show doing that, you know, where, where it's sweating and slippery. So I just started using the stick grip tape and then I kept using it even when it wasn't some hot outdoor show. I just kind of got used to it. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, sir. What size sticks do you use? Well, oh, that's the one product I forgot to mention during the, the clinic. I mentioned DW, Sabian, Evans, right? Uh, I have a signature stick through Regal Tip. That's what I'm using. It's called the Sobelizer. Don't laugh. What's it called? The Sobelizer. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't come up with the name, but it kind of stuck. But it, maybe it's like a 2B, but the weight distribution is different. Maybe it's a little more mid and top heavy, if that makes sense. They had a 7B, which was a heavier stick. Not like a 7A, a 7B was something heavier. And then they had like almost marching sizes. Yeah. And I said, you need something in the middle to, to split the difference. And this stick 
This is good. It's not too heavy, but it's heavy enough to where you don't have to work too hard, at least for me. I don't have to work too hard to get a bigger, fatter sound out of the drums. There's a threshold where you pass it, and it's too heavy, and then you're working too hard. But if it's too light, and you play in a rock gig, the drums are going to have a thinner sound to them. Yeah. So this is why the stick size is such a personal thing for each drummer. It depends on the kind of music you're playing and the touch you have on the drums. Are they longer? Maybe a tiny bit than average, yeah, by an eighth or so. I should know the exact dimensions, and I totally don't. But it, it's something that, that worked. They sent out a bunch of different kilograms of weight, and I kept moving up each night until I found one. Every then I backed off, and that's how we arrived at the, the weight and the size. And they were Glenn, really good about that. You Regal tip. Uh, sorry, you, you mentioned you know preparing yourself for a rock gig and being able to really put out the volume. But at the same time, did you notice that most of the time he was playing on this kit, his movements, movements were very economized, yet you were getting the volume out. So it's not like you were, you know, looked like a circus monkey just totally doing the Peter Townsend windmills the whole time. Well, it might look different on the gig, on the Alice gig. Second favorite drummer, what kind of cologne is he wearing? Or... <laughs> oh, wow. oh, and it just got back on. Okay, so we're back on again. Okay. So, um, how do you put when you travel so much? Because I, I, we travel a lot, but what do you do when you're getting ready to do like gig after gig after gig? What would be your uh, regimen just to get ready to stay healthy? Oh, yeah, that's that could be tough, you know. Um, no matter what the accommodations are, whether you're traveling in a van or private plane, it, it's just it's a grueling schedule, and you've got to eat. I mean, a drummer is burning calories yeah. more than anybody else on that stage. Don't tell anybody else in the band I said that, if you're in a band, because they think they're burning the most. But no, I mean, come on. The drummer is done. You can take your shirt off, and you can wring it out. You know, we need the good carbs, you know, oatmeal, those kind of carbs, the stuff that you got to have in the morning that give you energy, sustain throughout the day, protein. Captain Crunch. Not Captain Crunch, <laughs> but you know, I like those, those yogurts, those Faye yogurts. Those are a, a good thing to eat maybe 45 minutes, an hour before the show. You should go on on an empty stomach complete, but not a full stomach. You figure this out, what works yeah. for you, but you can't forget to eat. That's important. And, and we try to have things provided for us, good protein bars, and we try to keep that stocked on the bus. And it, it is hard to stay healthy on tour, and, and you got to make sure and get sleep. It's all these basic things that you think are easy, but it's hard to get good sleep sometimes. I don't sleep great on the tour bus. You know, I do my best. But sleep and food, who knew that, that you needed that wow. to function? What a revelation. Yeah. And good hydration. Yeah. Hey, we had a question. The treadmill, 20 minutes, nothing crazy, but enough to work up a sweat and maybe a little bit of weights, you know, do some back, chest, shoulders. Again, not a heavy workout, but it makes the show easier at night. For me, it does. The Alice Cooper show is very, it can be brutal some nights. Uh, if we're in a theater where the oxygen flow is not great, I have an oxygen tank on stage where I've got the mask and I hit the button and get the free flow of O2 coming through. And especially if there's smoke from the pyrotechnics, mm -hmm. That can make it kind of tough when you want to take a deep breath and <laughs> you, know, you, you cough, you get the fresh O2, it helps. Like I, I've seen a lot of drummers do this and a lot of singers. Mm -hmm. Drummers and singers. And with the thing with the Alice gig, Alice Cooper does not talk between songs. He doesn't break character. Right. And so that could be tough on a drummer. It's like one song ends, you're starting the next one, and it's just over and over until there's finally a guitar solo. Anita Strauss... Does a solo, and I was I was just going, please, 
let them think that's a good idea that Nita does a solo by herself. <laughs> yeah, you should do a solo, Nita. That's a good idea. A long one. And finally, I get like two, two and a half minutes. It's like the golden break, finally. Yeah. And then there's a ballad or two later in the set where I don't play in the intro of the first verse. So that's, that's a good break. But you got to be in shape for the gig. You can't be eating milkshakes and fries all day. No way. Question? Do you sing? Uh, I have sang backup vocals here and there, but not on the Alice gig. I know that Eric Singer didn't do that either, and he's done a lot of singing while playing, but not on that. I think because of the gig being so demanding. Yeah. Yeah. I got to take one more question for the show, and then Glenn will hang out and can ask him anything you want. This is again from Brandon Koo, and it actually ties into something I was going to ask you to explain to people, and that is that not all rock star gigs are glamorous. There's a whole other side to it, and Brandon's asking, can Glenn talk more about his early days? in his progressive band and his struggles. And that, so you can mesh those two questions together however you see fit. Well, I started out like a lot of people started out. My first real U.S. tour was in a van mm -hmm. back in the 90s. And it was Motel 6s and Super 8s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sharing a room. But you know what? I was happy to do it. And fortunately, things got a little better in accommodations. But again, it's... It's always going to be draining on you in some way. You have to be able to deal with that and deal with the people around you. You know, on the Hollywood Vampires tour over the summer, we were flying private from gig to gig, just driving right up to the plane on the tarmac in some cases, hubbing out of cities, meaning when you hub, we were like in Copenhagen, we'd play the show there, and then the next night we'd play in Stockholm, Sweden. So we'd fly to Stockholm during the day, and after the show, fly back to Copenhagen. At night, stay at the same hotel. The next day, fly to Gothenburg Street and fly back to Copenhagen and do that for a week. That was draining just because you're in like a van and a plane and a van and another van. Constantly and being shuffled around. Yeah, you're being shuffled into different vehicles. It's planes, trains, and automobiles, big time. Not that I'm complaining. It was, it was great. We had a great time. There's going to be more to come. New record coming out with Hollywood Vampires. But you, then it was back to the bus on the Alice Cooper solo band gig. And I kind of missed some things about the bus. I like waking up in the morning and making breakfast on the bus, just with oatmeal and whatever. And you got to be able to adapt and be able to get along with other people. When you're on a bus with no hotels, that's another level of tour. You have a bus, you go, yeah, we got a bus, but we don't have any hotel rooms. You got to shower at venues, right? Or maybe on a day off, there's one hotel room for everybody to shower in or chill in. So basically, everybody is like this with everybody else. You're in everybody's face 24-7, except for when you're in your bunk, where you close that little curtain, and finally, that's your private time. And it's so, like being, I mean, being in a band. You gotta be able to get along Yeah, with even without going on tour, it's like being married to three or four yeah. other people, let alone going on tour, whether it's a bus, or a train, or a van, or whatever. So getting along is real important. Glenn, thanks so much for taking time with us oh, of here course. from Talk TV. It's weird. Glenn lives in the neighborhood I grew up in, but I'm a little bit older, so we didn't know each other then. <laughs> and it's it's cool to be out here in Phoenix where we've moved to, you know, in the area. And folks, if you're going to the NAM show, have you heard of the NAM show? Are you going? Yeah, I think I heard about that. <laughs> Are you going? It's a lot of people of there, right? right? Well, Glenn will come by the booth, I'm sure, one of those days. Uh, stay in tune to our schedule. We have our own Drum Talk TV booth, 6732. We're going to be doing all kinds of interviews, autograph signings. There's four other correspondents besides me, so you're not stuck with me the whole time. You have correspondents now. Oh, we have for you're years. You're like the Daily yeah. Show or something. Yeah, we have for years. I love it. We're doing uh, interviews in Spanish as well. Three years ago, we did English, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. And before we started that, before the actual NAMM show dates come, I, I told Lori, I said, oh, let's add Italian and Japanese, right. and, the, and by the second day of the NAMM show, I said, we are never doing this multi-language thing again. <laughs> because it takes me so much time to set up the appointments and the interviews, but that's this a lot of work. Yeah, we're bringing Spanish back with two correspondents that are bilingual. Uh, Nadia Azar, Dr. Nadia Azar will be with me in our booth interviewing drummers on drumming injuries. Not whacking your nose with a stick or cracking a boob or something, but more like a sciatica, carpal tunnel, ten tendonitis, things like that. So we'd love to have you. So look for Glenn with us at the NAMM show. If you can't go, uh, sorry. No, just kidding. If you can't go, we're streaming everything live all four days. So thanks for following what we do here on Drum Talk TV. And again, Glenn, thank you so much for a wonderful time. Thank you for joining us here in the interview. Thank you for coming out, everybody.